Hello, everyone. We're going to get started. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, if it is your first time on Zoom, just a note, you're all muted to prevent background noise. So don't worry if your dog starts barking. And also your videos are off, but please join us in the chat room to ask questions and introduce yourself. And we will address, try to address questions as they come. Um, I, my name is Sarah Halson. I'm the Detroit Audubon's program coordinator, and we are working to offer more of these presentations. So please keep watching our Facebook page and our website. And if you receive our uh, Flyway Express in your email, hopefully you are enjoying those. Um, Detroit Audubon fosters the appreciation and conservation of birds and the animal environment that we share. We're excited to share our love of birding with you. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce my coworker, Eva, take it away. Hi, everybody. Thank you, Sarah, for introducing me. Um, I'm Detroit Audubon, Audubon's um, research coordinator, and I'm very excited to present this to all of you. So, to get started, there we go. Okay, so. Why birds? Why is birding even a thing? Um, so birding is different than um, any other kind of paying attention to any animal because of how um, visible birds are to us. Um, uh, they're much more visible than any other creature. Many mammals are nocturnal, um, meaning that they're out and about while we are sleeping and they are sleeping while we're out and about during the day. Um, but many birds are out during the day, so we're able to see them much more. Um, other animals such as amphibians and reptiles, they're far more secretive. Um, some birds can be very secretive too, um, but generally a lot of them seem to have learned that humans are not a huge threat and so they exist around us and they commonly exist right kind of above us out of our reach, making them very visible but still safe from any harm. Um, they are easy for us to see and they can be extremely beautiful because of their wide range of colors. Um, many birds have evolved males that have bright colors to impress the females. Um, and these colors are also very attractive to humans. Um, and they sing, and this is wonderful. Again, these songs are mostly for other birds to hear, but that doesn't take away from their beauty. Um, the songs are very constant and very varied, um, and they tell us a lot of information about what bird is singing and what that bird is communicating to other birds. Um, there's also many birds that you can hear much more often than you can actually see them. Um, and you might have no idea that that bird is even around unless you know that specific call or song. Um, even in landscapes significantly altered by humans, birds are diverse and abundant. In an urban area, there will probably be no um, amphibians or reptiles or even very few mammals except for maybe um, domestic animals or maybe rats um, in an urban area, but there's many birds that really thrive in these urban areas. Um, and I'll touch on this more a little bit later. So. That is why birding is a thing as opposed to other animals. Um, and that is why people around the world have kind of fallen in love with birding and they spend money to go travel and see birds and to attract birds to their yards. Um, and that's why birding is increasing in popularity. So I'm gonna start off with your birding toolbox. Um, so we have a couple things here that you can use to help ID birds. Um, some of them have different uses than others. Some are a little bit more reliable. Um, so we have color, shape, size, proportions, field markings, calls and songs, and habitat and behavior. So first one here is color. Um, color is a really good place to start, but it's not always super reliable. Um, so to show this, I have this beautiful blue gross beak here. Um, in the right light, you can see that it's super blue, but in not great lighting, you can barely tell what color it is. Um, and so that kind of shows that color is not very dependable because many times you're not able to see the color depending on what light situation you have, um, or especially if that bird is moving too quickly for you to even kind of register what color it is. 
Um, but here I have this picture and these birds, you cannot see any color on them at all. Um, so really color is no use to you here. Um, but because of the shape, um, I can identify these birds and I think many of you would have a good guess at what these birds are, um, judging by how they're sitting, their behavior, how they're holding their head and their wings. I can tell that these are vultures, so using their shape. So that brings us to shape, which is one of your best tools, um, one of my favorite tools. Um, so this picture has all of these birds blacked out. Um, there's no colors in these, um, but you can see the shape of all of them. And I bet that you can actually identify what type of birds many of these are. So we have a poll um, that I think Sarah will be able to show. And so take a look at this um, and then write down how many bird groups you're able to identify. So if something is a hawk, or a woodpecker, or a duck, anything like that, how many of those you think you could identify? So I'll give you a second for that. I'll give it a little bit more time. We have a little bit over half of people have voted. I'll give you a little bit more time. I'll wait until two minutes and then we'll, we'll go ahead. Okay. Good. Yeah, that is great. Around seven to 10. That definitely makes a lot of sense. And I will go through a couple of these. Um, so some of the, to me, some of the easiest ones would be this guy right here. Um, this is pretty clearly a duck. You can see that it's sitting in water and it has the duck bill. Um, Let's see who else is here. Um, this, I think most of you could identify with the little tufts is a little owl. Um, this guy up against the wood light right there, you could tell by the kind of the, how he's placed and if it was real life by his behavior that that's a woodpecker. Um, these, I think a lot of people could identify as geese. And this guy up here is with the wings outstretched like that. Um, a lot of people could tell that that is a um, type of raptor, maybe a hawk or a vulture. Um, so we'll go to the next slide. Um, so, so here's some of the groups of birds here and the kind of the basic shapes that they have. Um, I think that these basic shapes are really, helpful to learn for your birding um, and to me they're also really fun because all of these different groups of birds they have different characteristics and adaptations um, and understanding those will really help your birding. Um, many of these birds there's there's only I think one or two kingfishers in, in Michigan. Um, and so if you see a kingfisher and you recognize that it's a kingfisher, um, then you, you know what species it is. Um, so knowing the general shapes of birds can be very, very helpful. Um, again, some of the easy ones, we have ducks and gulls, 
hawks, a hummingbird, the woodpeckers, um, the owl up here, and, and little sparrows, um, and doves and pigeons. That's another easy one. Um, so those are really fun to learn. You could just sit down with a book and kind of start reviewing those or um, look at some of the apps that I like to use for um, learning as well. And we'll go over those later. Next, we have size and proportions. So size is kind of like color. It's a good place to start, um, but sometimes it's not very reliable. Um, and that's because it can be really hard to determine size from far away, um, especially if you do not have um, something that you can compare it to. So if it's up in a tree, you it can be really hard to know um, the exact or even the general size of that bird. Um, so for example, I have the downy woodpecker here and the hairy woodpecker over on the right side. Um, and these look exactly the same, except the hairy woodpecker is about two inches bigger. Um, and when you see these guys up in a tree, normally they're not going to be side by side like this. This is a really nice picture. Um, so it can be really hard to tell if you're looking at a downy or a hairy woodpecker. Um, so that is where proportion comes into play. And proportion, you can kind of use comparing parts of the bird's body to other body parts. Um, and that can help you ID a bird. Um, so here, the downy woodpecker has this little beak, and this beak is maybe about half the size of the bird's head. But then if we look at the hairy woodpecker, this guy's beak is much longer compared to the length of his head. Um, and so that is how you can use body proportions to help you identify a bird. Um, this is another bird, the Cooper's hawk and the sharp chin hawk. Um, they look almost exactly the same, and their body sizes can even overlap um, because a um, female sharp shinned hawk is, is generally bigger than the males, and that can be the same size as a male cooper hawk. Um, they overlap perfectly, so it can be very difficult. Um, so with these guys, there's other um, characteristics kind of similar to proportion, such as I think head shape and how long the tail is compared to the rest of the body um, that you can use for identifying some of these trickier birds. Next, we have field markings. Um, so field markings are a um, something specific on the bird that tells you what the bird is. Um, it's something usually pretty obvious and usually pretty unique to the bird. Sometimes you have to use multiple field markings to determine um, the species of a bird. But I have a couple examples here. Um, so first, I have this guy. Um, and with this completely white head, there's only one hawk in Michigan, and I think in the US, um, that has a completely white head like this. We know that it's a bald eagle. So this all white head is our field marking that tells us it's a bald eagle. That one's very simple. So then a little bit trickier. Um, I have another bird here. Um, it's kind of thrush um, shaped. Um, and we can see it's all gray. It has a black cap and it has a little rufous butt. Um, and so using those three characteristics together, I'm able to identify this as a cat bird. There's no other bird that has those three characteristics. Um, and then field markings can get really crazy um, when we are looking at um, little sparrows or warblers. They all look very similar, and so you really would have to memorize all of these little um, different face markings to be able to tell sparrows from other sparrows. Um, so I have the American tree sparrow here and we can see it has this little red cap. It has a little reddish stripe through the eye and it has the little black dot on its chest. And so I would use those three field markings to identify the bird. Um, so this can be helpful if you see a bird, you can take note of all of the field markings that you see. Um, and then write those down or keep those wherever and then come back um, and look online, look in a book, talk to a bird or friend and figure out what that bird is. So field markings you can also use to um, try to take note of those and then identify a bird later on. Then we have calls and songs. Um, these are also really great. Um, 
I think that if you take the time to learn birds calls and songs, you will definitely enjoy birding a whole lot more. Um, there's, there's many birds um, that I rarely see, but I hear them all the time. And so knowing those calls and songs really provides a lot of information for you. Um, calls are generally um, shorter and a lot of them are like warning calls or contact calls. Um, and then songs are usually longer and those are um, used for showing territory or for attracting mates. Um, songs can be a little bit more distinct. A lot of bird calls sound very similar. A lot of them all are just like little chip calls. Um, but the, the songs are different, but the songs are generally um, heard more often in spring and summer. In the fall and winter, you will not hear birds singing their songs as much. Um, when you're first learning some of these songs and calls, mnemonics are a great way to learn them. And so this is a really cute comic from um, birdandmoon.com um, where she wrote out what all of these birds sound like they're saying. Um, so the cat bird right here in the middle sounds like it's saying meow when it makes its call. Um, and the yellow warbler says, sweet, sweet, I'm so sweet. And knowing kind of how those sound can really help you identify those out in the field. They're a great way to get started. So Ava, we have a question uh, um, yeah. from Sheila. She asked, isn't there an audiobook with bird calls for identification that you can use for study purposes? Yeah, there's many, many resources now that offer that. Um, there's, there's definitely a lot of audiobooks. I haven't used any specific audiobook, um, but there's also a lot of different apps where you can play the calls. Um, so I really like the Merlin Bird ID app, and I'll touch on that a little bit more later. Um, but I like to just go through the app and click on birds and, and listen to their different calls. Um, and you can do that online as well, and that is a really great learning method. Um, then we have habitat and behavior. This is another one that I think is really um, helpful and interesting and fun. Um, so habitat will tell you a lot about what bird you are likely to see in the area um, and behavior can tell you a lot as well. I have a couple examples here. Um, if you see little birds um, hanging around people in a cafe, um, I'm 99% sure that those are house sparrows because there's no other sparrow um, that hangs around people so close by in these little foraging groups. Um, and if I see a bird that is moving down a tree um, with, its, with its head down like that, upside down, um, I know that that is some type of nuthatch because that is one of the only birds that does that behavior. Um, and then lastly, when I see a bird that is up on a telephone pole, especially around the highway, um, I'm usually very sure that that is a red-tailed hawk because that's a very common red-tailed hawk behavior um, and most other hawks do not do that. Um, so learning about habitat and behavior is very useful. Um, Watching birds, even if it's the same type of bird day after day, can really help your ID skills by learning that specific behavior, behavior of that bird. And then when you see a behavior that is more unique, you know that this could be a new bird that you have not seen before. Um, so binoculars. Um, I'm not gonna talk about binoculars too much um, because a lot of us don't have binoculars at home. Um, I do not think binoculars are necessary, especially for a lot of the backyard birding that we're doing right now. Um, I like to just sit by a window or sit quietly outside and the birds will usually come pretty close to you. Um, and just watching that bird behavior is really great. Um, but binoculars are useful for ID, or if you're out on a hike and the birds might be farther away up in the trees. Um, the one note about binoculars is when you see a bird and you want to look at it with your binoculars, you will focus on the bird and then bring your binoculars up to your face without dropping your gaze. Um, if you kind of lower your face to meet your binoculars and then look up for the bird, you're going to be much more zoomed in and you'll have a really hard time finding the bird and you'll probably have to lower your binoculars and look again and figure out where that bird is and then try again with your binoculars. Um, so that definitely takes a lot of practice um, and practicing with binoculars, even looking for a specific um, 
leaf or something in the tree, just practicing looking at something and, and bringing your binoculars up to your face and finding that thing again. Um, it's really easy to get lost when you have the binoculars up on your face because everything is so zoomed in, it looks different and you can't even remember which direction the bird is in or where it is. Ava, we have a question regarding tips for using yes. binoculars with the glasses. Mm -hmm. Do you have oh. any? Yeah, there's, um, so most binoculars have a little, um, like a little twisty thing where you, where, right where the little glasses go up against your face. Um, and those, if you don't wear glasses, you kind of twist those out. Um, and then if you do have glasses on, then you leave those twisted in. Um, it's a little bit hard to describe. I should have, I might have binoculars. kidding I don't um but there's generally there's there's that little tool um and then they should work perfectly normal um I think most people are pretty fine using um binoculars with glasses okay so my next birding tip is um practicing describing where a bird is um birding alone is really wonderful, um, but when you're learning birds, um, it can be a lot nicer to um, go birding with other people. Um, that'll help you learn your birds and you guys can kind of learn together or help each other out. Um, and so that gets really tricky if somebody sees a bird and the other person doesn't see the bird. Um, you're trying to point out the bird to somebody and you're usually just pointing and you're saying it's over there, it's over there. Um, but people can't, I, it's, a bird is too small, and so just pointing at it usually isn't going to tell a person where it is. Um, and so you want to practice using um, kind of the, the distinct cues um, with the different trees or shrubs that you're looking at to describe where a bird is. Um, so my example here is for this cardinal up here. Um, if I'm just pointing at it and my partner is still not able to see the bird, um, then I could describe this placement by saying all the way over to the left, there's a small pine tree and then there's a tall tree behind that pine tree. And if you go up that tree um, close to the top, it forks and there's a fork at the left of the tree and the bird is at that fork. And so then my partner can follow those instructions and kind of go from the pine tree, okay, the tall tree behind it, and then there's this fork and here's my little cardinal that I'm trying to see. Um, oh, whoops. Um, and so then I, I also have this woodpecker here, so you can kind of just take five seconds um, and think about how you might describe that cardinal's placement. Um, if it was a really, a really small little brown bird or something um, that you're not able to see um, very well and you're trying to point out to your friend where is this bird so that you can both see it and then work together to identify it. So just take five seconds and then I'll tell you how I would describe that. Um, so I would say there's, there's two tall, straight trees next to each other, um, and they're moving parallel to each other. And on the tree to the right, there's two knots, and a little bit above the higher knot, this little, these little things, little nubbies are called knots. And so on the knot there, um, the, the higher up knot, the woodpecker is right by that knot. And so using that description, my partner can kind of follow that and then see the bird. And that's really helpful because if two people are able to see the bird, you can work together to figure out what kind of bird it is. And it's sad <laughs> if somebody sees a cool bird and you're not able to find it because you're not able to um, see where the bird is and then you miss it. Um, so my next bit of advice is to just continue practicing to identify birds. Um, even if you're looking at the same birds in your backyard all the time, um, recognizing these birds over and over and over again 
will help you for when a new bird does show up in your backyard. And this especially makes me think of the sparrows. I always have the little house sparrows in my backyard. Um, but, and I, and I watch them all the time. I watch their cute little behaviors and they hop around and take little dust baths. Um, but then it, when I, when there is a new type of sparrow in there, I, I just, I notice that something is different about that bird. And so then I know this is a new bird and I have to go grab my guidebook and figure out what this new sparrow is. Um, but I might not even recognize that bird if I'm not, um, thinking about each, each house sparrow and, and taking into those little ID um, hints and tactics to figure out what bird, what each bird is. Um, and keep asking questions. That's very important. Um, this is how we learn and you should not worry about looking silly or dumb because everybody is always learning and it's very easy to forget a bird call. I still forget what a robin sounds like um, and, and that just that happens um, and I think it's also good to remember that not all bird people are people people but 99% of bird people love talking about birds and so they're going to be happy to answer any bird related question. Next, um, bringing birds to you. This is especially important right now while we're uh, a little bit more stuck at home. Um, having bird feeders up to bring more birds to you is a really great way to see a little bit more diversity in the birds. Um, so I would recommend sunflower seeds or thistle. Um, these help bring in a little bit more variety of birds, such as these common feeder birds like goldfinches, cardinals, chickadee, tufted titmouse. Um, if, if you use some of the cheaper, less quality seed, you end up just feeding a lot of house sparrows. Um, and, and that can be fine. Like I said, I love watching house sparrow behavior, but you'll, you'll um, probably want to see a little bit more diversity. Seeing different birds is pretty fun. So um, these two seeds, the sunflower seeds and the thistle seed is, is what I would recommend. Um, Water is also very important, especially if you don't want to spend money on seed. Water is a great option because all birds need water. Um, and it's especially cute in the spring and summer when they take a little bath in the water. Um, that is one of my favorite things to see. So setting up, you can have a bird bath or um, just setting up a little dish of water. I have that sitting out on a table. Um, and lastly, native plants. This is a big one. Um, we do have many birds that are seed eaters, like the birds that I just mentioned, um, but a lot more birds are insect eaters. And m almost all birds feed their baby birds um, insects and bugs. And so they need a ton of bugs to feed their babies. They have really fast metabolisms and they constantly need food. Um, and those bugs need native plants. So if you plant native plants, you are bringing in different bugs, native bugs, um, and those bugs feed the birds and those, the birds desperately need that. Um, a, a lack of food is a big reason why um, bird populations are declining. And um, we have another presentation coming up. Um, in a couple weeks, it'll be all about native plants and how to plant native plants and pick native plants. Um, I'm really excited about that. And that is a pretty, pretty easy way that you can support birds and native wildlife in general. Um, and I think we have a poll. First, we have a, we have a couple questions first um, okay. regarding bird feeders. Um, mm -hmm. someone asked, can you have a bird feeder if you have a cat? She's never <laughs> brought a bird to us. Um, that's tricky. Um, outdoor cats are actually a really huge problem for birds. And I would recommend that if you do have a cat around your yard that you do not try to also bring birds into your yard. Um, unfortunately, our cats are just too talented of hunters. Um, and we don't know for sure if they are, even if they don't bring a bird to you, it's very likely that they're still um, grabbing birds, especially the young um, little like fledgling birds. When they come out of the nest, they can't fly super well right away. 
Um, and so they're really easy for cats to grab. And the cats sometimes don't kill them, they just wanna play with them. Um, but any, even just a bite from a cat, the bacteria in the cat's mouth will kill the bird. Um, so it's tricky and I know that my cats used to going outside, but I don't let them go outside anymore. Um, because the effect on birds is actually a lot more detrimental than I think a lot of us realize. Um, so it, it can be really hard to, to make a outdoor cat become an indoor cat. So I just, I recommend when you do get any new cats or new, well, just new cats, um, just make the decision to keep that cat as a cat. Okay, we had another question about squirrels and bird feeders. And if oh. there are any tricks to keep them. Yeah, there's a lot of um, things that you could buy. They're called like squirrel baffles. Um, and those can be helpful from keeping squirrels away. Um, there's also what I kind of like about thistle seed is that it's so small that it really, the squirrels are not super interested in it unless they're really desperate. Um, but that is just using thistle is a good way to attract birds without attracting squirrels. Um, and then there's definitely a lot of different, uh, like I said, the baffles that you can buy. Um, and, and those help prevent the squirrels from getting to the feeders. And our final question about bird feeders um, from Sheila. I love bluebirds and have tried bluebird houses and mealworms. Any other ideas? Um, I feel your pain. I've tried to feed bluebirds and mealworms too. I bought a bunch of dried mealworms and nobody was interested at all. Um, I don't have any great tips for that. Um, cause I've, I've been trying to attract bluebirds too and I haven't had a whole lot of luck. Um, I think that the mealworms are a good option and, and sometimes you just have to keep trying until one bird finds that you have this food resource and then they should keep coming back. Um, there is a whole bluebird society um, that you could look into and I bet they would have some good advice for you. Okay, and we also we got the, well, we did just get the popular question about rodents being attracted by birds. Yes. Yeah, that is, that's really tricky. Um, and, and that is, that can be a problem. So something that you can do about that is again, the little tiny thistle seeds, I think help with that because the rodents are really not super interested in those. They're too small. Um, as well, if you do want to have the larger seeds like sunflower seeds, if you clean them up off of the ground semi-regularly, that can help decrease pests as well. Um, but the other thing is that native plants help your birds and native plants are really not going to feed the the rats and the raccoons or whatever else you're worried about. Um, so if if you are kind of worried about the mess from the seeds and the rodents, then go with native plants. Okay, great. I think we're ready to launch the poll to kind of see where everyone is at right now. I convince people to plant native plants. <laughs> Um, so we'll give like a minute and a half. Oh, almost everybody has voted already. So great. I'll give it like 10 more seconds. Well, I'm glad to see a lot of people have native plants. I I love native plants. Um, I think they're wonderful and really fun. Um, and um, that actually brings us into um, my next topic. Um, so am I good to exit out of this? Yes, and we did have a question about native plants. So I, I thought we can just definitely make sure you all know that we will be doing a, a whole presentation on native plants coming up in the next couple weeks. Yep, we will we'll send information about that presentation in the next um, Flyway Express. And if you are not getting those Flyway Express emails, um, just feel free to email our um, 
staff email, which is on our website. Any questions, send us an email. Um, so um, now that we've talked about how to attract birds, we have to talk about um, our threats to birds. And um, this is where cats and uh, other things come into play. Um, so the number one threat to birds is habitat loss. Um, and we have seen um, research published in 2019 shows that bird populations have dropped by nearly um, 3 billion birds across North America. Um, and that's a decline of about 30% since 1970. So in not a very long time, our bird populations have plummeted. Um, and when that came out, that was extremely surprising and staggering to scientists. They were not expecting bird populations to be, um, have gone through this detrimental loss. Um, so I, I really think we do need to think about these top threats to birds. Um, and like I mentioned, habitat loss is a huge one, um, but it's tricky. There's not a ton that an individual can do about habitat loss, um, but, the native plants is something that you can do by using native plants um, and, and creating your property, turning your property into bird habitat is a way that you can combat habitat loss. Um, the next problem is cats. Um, if you look up a chart on the reasons why um, birds are dying, uh, outdoor cats is a huge one. It's like outdoor cats and then it's like everything else is down here. Um, so, so, and that, that includes like outdoor cats, stray cats, um, feral cat colonies, um, farm cats. They're, they're just kind of, like I said, they're too good at hunting. Um, and, and many birds are not adapted to dealing with those hunters. And so um, they're, they're really detrimental to bird populations. Um, so that's, that's something to keep in mind with, uh, pet cats and and find um, most bird people still love cats I have three cats at home with me much um, but but I think that we do want to be conscientious of how outdoor cats affect birds um, and and if there are uh, if there is like a stray cat colony near you um, possibly putting in the effort to um, make sure those cats are spayed and neutered so at least those po populations are not increasing um, window collisions is another um, huge problem and some of these windows are windows of really large buildings like in the cities um, the lights from the buildings really disorient the birds um, many birds migrate at night and so the lights from these buildings um, confuse their systems they use the stars and the moon to migrate um, and so these bright lights really confuse their, their um, navigation systems. Um, they can end up just circling a building repeatedly until they die of exhaustion. Um, and then even residential buildings, these windows on, on smaller buildings, they still, they see the reflection of trees and habitat and they think that they can just keep flying through. Um, and then many times they don't die right away. They, they might fly off um, and then die later from the head trauma. Um, and, and so we don't, we don't see all of the birds that our windows are impacting. Um, so if you, if you do have windows that you think are problematic, if you've seen a couple birds crash into them, um, definitely consider uh, a system to make those windows visible to birds. And that's another thing that you can email us about if you are interested in those products. Um, and then lastly, pesticides. Um, like I mentioned, those, the pests that you are killing are bird food and the birds need that food. Um, so definitely consider not using pesticides on your lawn or in your garden. Okay, sorry, that's very depressing, but it has to be said and now we can. But we have um, one question though, if you had any yeah. opinion on window feeders, the ones that section of the outside. Yes. Um, those are interesting and it is, some research has shown that if you have feeders in your backyard, you will have more window collisions, but actually a way that you can help that is actually by putting your feeders closer to a window. So those little, those like stick on window feeders are actually, should be pretty fine. Um, 
the birds, they can't, if they're flying from the window to the, um, <coughs> sorry, if they're flying from the window or from the feeder to the window, they can't build up a lot of speed. And so they usually don't hurt themselves. Um. <coughs> okay. Um, now I'm going to go into some uh, resources for learning more about birds and improving your ID skills. Looking at bird websites is really great. Um, National Audubon is wonderful for this. They have so many fun and interesting articles, um, little quizzes like this one, a photo ID for beginner birders, um, or just really um, simple specific um, things like how to tell the difference between crows. They're really fun to look at, so I would definitely recommend that. Um, could you, Sarah, can you take over for me for a second? My throat is really dry and I need water. Oops, absolutely. Um, okay, so we did have some questions about uh, field guide recommendations. So this is our favorite phone app if you are interested in using your phone for IDing. It's um, from the Cornell Lab. It's called Merlin Bird ID and it is free which is fantastic. Um, so once you download it, you are able to, once you load it, you're able to download different bird packs depending on where you live. So for, um, for Michigan, there is a Midwest bird pack that you can download. And then if you go to other places, you can download different ones, but they do take a lot of space. So you wouldn't want to download them all. Um, so when you are looking to see if you have a bird that you recognize, you, um, it will refine the list by the location where you're at and the most likely birds that would be there in that location at that time of year. So this shows you can, you can go in and explore birds, look up and refine that bird list and it comes up with a list of birds that you might be seen and you can look through that way. Um, the other way that you can use the this app is on the next slide. Yes, and I'll, I'll also um, chime in. Um, this, this is my favorite app and I really like to use this app, especially for just um, looking at the birds and seeing what birds are around. And this is also what I use to practice bird calls and listen to the different calls. Mm -hmm. um, and there's there's this ID tool that you can use. You just have to enter a little bit of information. Um, you go to the on the kind of the home screen. It says bird ID. You just put in the basic size, um, a little bit of behavior, and the main colors, and it'll give you a couple birds that they believe are likely. Oh, and it also has you enter the location and the date. That's very important. Um, and then using all of that information, they'll come up with a bird that is, uh, or several different birds that are likely to be the bird that you saw. How do you stop this? You can't, it's not. I don't know, maybe it's uh, not safe. Uh, okay, and then uh, Sarah, if you can take back over for field guides. Okay, so we did have some questions about books that we recommend. So these are a few that we do recommend and use. Um, there's a Birds of Detroit book that I believe it might be out of print, but you can still research it and find it. Um, and so it's great. It's specific to birds you'll find in the city of Detroit, and there are quite a few. Um, and then the other books are these two, these series, The Birds of Michigan. So there's both a, an adult field guide and a kid's guide. The kid's guide is rather new. Um, what we like about this book is it is by color. Um, so even though Ava said color isn't always the most, the best, most reliable tool, it is a tool and it's a nice it's a good way. starting point. It's a good starting point. It's a great for beginners. So this is an older version of that book and along the sides, it, eh, you probably can't see, you can kind of, maybe you can see, it has the different mm -hmm. colors. So if you're looking for the cardinal, you're going to go to the red section and you'll find a great big picture of the cardinal and a lot of information about where they live and their habitats and diet, et cetera. 
Um, and then if you're a little more advanced or um, want to get more advanced, um, I like the Peterson Field Guides. Um, they have at the beginning, they have that silhouette guide that Ava was talking about. And what's nice about these two, it can, it can be overwhelming, but also helps you when you're really trying to figure out which sparrow you're looking at. You can have them, they're all next to each other and it points to all the different um, field marks that Ava was talking about. So it points to the, the caps on their head, the different colors or the eye, or the eye stripes or the wing bars or any other distinguishing um, field marks. So this is a good one, but there's a lot of great books out there too. Um, I think that's it for field guides. Um, another great way once you're once you're birding and you want to kind of keep track of what birds you're seeing is to use eBird. Um, and eBird is also free. You can have an account on eBird. And what's fantastic about eBird, um, in addition to just being fun to keep track of the birds you've identified. It's a great citizen science opportunity. So scientists look to citizen birders like us to better understand the global bird populations. Um, so there's a really a lot that's still not known about birds, especially they're migrating since a lot of them migrate at night. So it's a, it's a great source for scientists to find, get a lot more information than they could on their own. So this is the website and I'm gonna start, I'm gonna share my screen real quick to, oops, that's the wrong one. Whoops, sorry. So I'm gonna share my screen with eBird just to show you a little bit what's on here. There's a lot of ways you can explore different birds that you find. You can explore specific species or regions that you might go to. Um, there's a whole science section where you can see some migrating patterns and actually see the animation of birds and their migration north or south. Um, so that is really fun to look at. But for actually submitting any birds that you have seen, you would go into submit. And this is mostly I would use the website if I like to go birding without my phone. And I'm gonna kind of keep track of the birds that I see in a notebook or some other way. When you come back, you can enter your location, you can enter um, the birds that you, well, you can enter the date and whether you were traveling or if you're in one spot, like in your backyard, or you can even enter incidental birds. Like if you were, you were out, you weren't necessarily birding, but you saw a peregrine falcon, for instance, if you're going through Detroit and you wanna just enter that you saw that, you can hit incidental. And I think it's going to force me to do all of this in order to show you the next part. Um, so I will continue from there. And then you can, it lists all the birds that would be in this location at this time. Um, so there's quite a few, but you can go through and list the number of each species that you saw. And then you can click down on the bottom, click submit. So that is how you could use the website. I like to go and be on my phone sometimes when I'm birding. Ava, if you could share the presentation again. Yep. So the eBird app is really user-friendly. And you can just turn it on when you start birding and enter them in and then turn it off and, it, and submit it. So I will show you some of those screenshots. And obviously it will be linked to your account online. Um, so when you open up the app, you just can click start checklist and it already has the date and time there. And then you can click on your location. Um, and you can have saved locations. So your home can be a saved location or a local park and you click on that. And then you can enter in the species that you are seeing. And again, use the field guides to, um, 
to figure out what birds you're seeing, either the books or your Merlin ID bird app or other ones. Um, and then you can enter in those species and enter the number that you see. And as you're birding, it's keeping track of the time and your, where you're going and, and the, the birds that you're seeing. So the ones that you've seen will end up on the bottom. And you can, if you see another robin, you can click on there and add a second, third, fourth, fifth robin. And then when you are done, you can click stop and it will really be, it, it, it definitely makes sure that you are done birding. So it asks you a couple questions and eBird really likes to have a complete list of birds. Um, so when you're birding, even if you feel like you've seen a lot of robins and you don't feel like you need to enter them, it's still important information. So they'd like to have that information. So it asks you if it's a complete list and then you click yes and submit. And you're not able to go back and edit that later. So once you click submit, you've submitted your list. So that is the eBird app. Okay, so now I will take back over. Um, I know that we've been, we've been talking for a little bit already. Um, so this, that was kind of a good overview of birding. Um, for the rest of the presentation, we're just going to be going over a couple of the most common birds that you will be seeing in your backyard. Um, I think this will be really helpful just to know kind of what some of those most common birds are. Um, but if you, this is a, a stopping point if um, people are getting antsy. Um, and I did want to mention we did have questions about whether this is being recorded and whether we'll share this PowerPoint and and resources, so we will. We have all of your emails, so we will send those out to you. And I do apologize for those of you that were hard, had a hard time finding the password to get in. I'm not sure how um, I usually Zoom works without needing to enter a password, so I will look and make sure that doesn't happen for the next presentation, but thank you for joining us. Great, and did, any questions? No new questions right now. Okay. Great, okay, so most common backyard birds. Um, I have these two pictures here for specific reasons. Um, this book is called Suburbia, and it's all about how um, the suburbs all across the US and in other countries actually have extremely high um, bird biodiversity. Um, some, some more than others, but um, some of them in some states actually have higher biodiversity in their suburbs than they do in a forest or woodland. Um, and I think that has to do with all of the different kind of mini habitats that we create with our yards. Um, so you can really see a lot just backyard birding. Um, and then if you're not in the suburbs, if you're in a more urban area, maybe in the middle of Detroit or something, um, there's still plenty of birds to be seen. That's why I have this peregrine falcon because there are peregrine falcons nesting um, in the uh, Midtown, Cass Corridor Commons area of um, Detroit. Um, and those are amazing to see. Sometimes you'll see them flying around. Um, and there's a couple other really cool birds that you can see even in the middle of Detroit. So no matter where you are, there's birding to be done. So we'll start with a couple of these birds. Uh, the first one here is the house sparrow. I've mentioned this guy a couple times already. Um, they seem to be everywhere. And that is because they really thrive in environments created by people. Um, so actually, if you go out on a hike in the woods, you'll probably not see these birds. Um, they really like to be around um, residential housing or, or restaurants or, or right in the middle of the city. Um, they've really adapted to living with people. Um, they're they're very smart things and so they're they're also very resourceful and that has really helped them spread across the u.s um because these birds are originally from europe um they were brought over to help with pest control and now to some people they've kind of become pests themselves um this guy here the bird with a little bit more darker markings is the male um he has some chestnut and some black on his face and then the little brown one, kind of tan and brown is the female. Um, and her most distinct field mark, I think, is this little light stripe behind her eye. And even though these guys are all over, 
they're watching them is still a lot of fun. They're very social. They're usually in, in small or large groups um, and they're interacting with each other. And a lot of times it's easy to see um, the parents raising their babies or their fledglings and you can see the babies like wiggling their wings at their parents. Um, the next bird is another invasive species um, originally from Europe that has done an amazing job at spreading around the U.S. and um, really making the most of living around people. Um, pretty similarly, European starlings are not really in, in the woods or wetlands as much. They're more kind of around our homes. Um, and they're this really pretty um, black with like a green or purple blue iridescence. Um, I think that one of the most distinguishing characteristics for identifying these birds is they have kind of a stubby tail you can see kind of compared to the rest of their body. Um, other birds like robins or grackles or blue jays, they all have longer tails. They really have kind of stubby tails for the rest of their body and a, a pretty long beak. Um, sometimes all black, but then when they molt, their fresh feathers at the, on the tip of each feather, they have a little white spot and so that's how they get these little white dots all over their body. It's actually the white tip of each feather. Um, and then these tips wear away as time goes on. And so then they end up all black like this bird here. And these birds are very smart. Um, they will mimic other bird noises and they make so many different noises. It can be pretty confusing because sometimes you'll hear a very weird noise and you're like, oh, it's a new bird, but it's just a starling that is like, babbling to itself. Um, they, they make just a very wide range of interesting noises. Um, these guys are so common that it's also pretty common to see um, the juvenile European starlings. Um, and this is what they look like, this guy in the corner. It's kind of this dull gray and you can see that it, it's getting some of those black feathers growing in under the wing here. Um, that's a common bird that I get questions about just because we do see a decent amount of the juveniles, but people are not sure what they are. Um, starlings also form these enormous flocks called murmurations, um, where the birds all seem to share a mind and, and know which direction they're all flying. And these can be really amazing to see. Um, other birds will do this as well, but um, it's very common for European starlings. The next bird is the morning dove. Um, and they're so beautiful. They're also very common, but they are a native bird, um, native to the U.S. and native to Michigan. Um, they've, they've really spread a lot and they can be found all over the place. They're this really nice like velvety tan um, and then have this kind of like a little bit of like the pinkish purple iridescence on their neck. Um, some of their field markings is this little spot here on their cheek, the little black spot. And then they also have black spots on their, kind of like their wings over here. Um, and they make a couple different noises. Um, I think Sarah's gonna try to play some of these noises for us, um, but we're not 100% we're not sure if it'll work, but we're gonna try. Um, so the wings, when they, when they take off and land, their wings actually make a whistling noise and it sounds like the bird is making the noise with its mouth, but it's actually just the um, wings moving through the air. Um, and then they also make a really sad um, cooing sound. And, and to humans, it sounds very sad and that's why we call them the morning dove because it sounds like they're in mourning. Um, so we'll, we'll try playing that call. <laughs> I, I heard that, so hopefully everybody was able to hear that. Um, yeah, sometimes people people think this is an owl, um, but it's it's a morning dove, and it's a it's a pretty common call. If you um, learn to recognize it, I'm sure you'll hear it several times this spring and summer. Um, next, we have the black cap chickadee. Um, this is a, a really tiny little bird. They're really fast moving and so sometimes they can be kind of hard to see. Um, to me they seem to like teleport between spaces because they move so fast. Um, they have a really large head and a little body 
the head is almost half the size of the body. Um, and they have the very distinct field markings of this black cap and a black chin. Um, and they really are like little acrobats you can see in this picture, like they hang upside down and they flit all around the trees and they're, they're just really wonderful to watch. Um, and they have their chickadee -dee call is a warning call and actually the number of DDs that you hear is, is the level of danger of whatever they are alerting the other birds about. Um, so we'll play that chickadee call. Wrong call. <laughs> that is their, that's their, that's actually their song. And so chickadees are one of the birds that actually have, that have a, um, a, a longer call than the song. So the song is just that like two or three note dee do to some people like Sarah, it sounds like it's saying cheeseburger, but I don't hear that. So whatever it makes sense to you, we can, we can play that call again and then maybe play the chickadee call. The warning call. Hmm. I'm trying to find the other call. Oh, the chickadee call just literally sounds like it's saying chickadee dee dee. Look at any any bird app. You can play their warning call, and you'll hear it saying "chicka dee dee dee," and it's great. Um, so we'll move on from there. Yeah, just move on. <laughs> <laughs> the next bird we have is the American robin, another really common bird. Um, they're, the males and females do look different, but they can be a little bit hard to tell apart because it's kind of um, just, just subtle differences. Um, the males usually have a darker head and maybe a more um, vibrant red breast. Um, and the juveniles, again, this is a common bird that you can usually see um, the babies or, or juveniles of this bird. They have the really cute speckled belly. Um, and that's adorable. I love seeing them. Um, and these are birds that you'll really commonly see um, hopping around the ground, hopping around in your lawn or in the leaves, um, looking for worms. And I, I love when I see them um, out in the garden, like they'll be, they'll like toss leaves around looking for worms. I think they are adorable. And they also have a really beautiful song. Um, I don't, I don't think we need call to play it right now because it's pretty long, um, but it is, oh, oh, we're playing it anyway. <laughs> Just a little bit. It's a really pretty and really like a little, like, um, has a really like a melody to it. Um, and that's, it's, it's one of the calls that you hear all spring and it's really beautiful. And, um, I think a lot of people don't realize that that is the robin who is uh, singing to us. Um, another big stinger is the northern cardinal. Um, we have up in the top corner is the male northern cardinal. Um, he's all red, very distinct. Um, and then the female is a little kind of more this olivey color, but you'll notice that the adult male and female both have this um, very red beak. Um, and they get that beak once they reach a certain age. Um, so if you see a cardinal that has a dull beak, like this one, that is a juvenile. So that bird is um, probably less than a year old, um, and, and it will eventually have the red beak, and it will either kind of develop the, the female card cardinal coloring um, or turn really bright red, like the male. Here's the blue jay. Um, I really don't think we have any birds that um, look similar to the blue jay. Um, they're, they're this kind of purplish blue and they're pretty large with the crest on their head. Um, and these birds are related to crows. Um, they're extremely smart and they will um, mimic the calls of other birds. Um, 
they will sometimes they will do a like a hawk call near a bird feeder and then all the other birds will will go hide because they think there's a hawk coming and then the blue jay will go to the feeder and feed all by itself and take all the food so they're extremely intelligent and make a lot of different noises um, the last bird I have here is what I think is our most common woodpecker. Um, it's the red-bellied woodpecker. Um, they, it's, its head is more red, yes, but there's a different woodpecker called the red-headed woodpecker, and its head is much more red. So this is the red belly. They have a little bit of red on their belly, but it's pretty hard to even see. Um, they have this beautiful like zebra stripe pattern on their back. Um, and the male has red all over his head and the back of his neck, while the female over here on the right side, she has red on the back of her neck, but not on like the cap of her head. So the males and females look different, so you can tell them apart, which is really nice. Um, and then I'm going to hand it back over to Sarah to talk about Global Big Day and we will wrap things up. Okay, great. So tomorrow is actually Global Big Day, which is a bird count. There's a lot of different uh, bird counting days throughout the year. The probably one of the oldest ones is the Christmas bird count. Um, but these, the big day is the first or second, I guess the second Saturday in May. And it is a, a time where people, birds are, birders are encouraged to go out and bird all on the same day and submit their, the species that they see on eBird. Um, so we are, since, since we are all mostly at home um, and we, aren't, we usually are able to do a field trip or something for this day, we are encouraging everybody to backyard, go in your backyard and watch birds or go to your local park if, if that works out to watch birds and to s commit to watching them for at least 30 minutes and upload those species that you see onto eBird. So we do have a pledge form that I can list in the chat box. So you can go there or I will also send it out to you later today with all of the other resources and video from today's um, webinar. Um, we've, we're trying to cover a lot of Metro Detroit and you can see from the map that we're doing a pretty good job, but we can always use some more. So we hope that you uh, will join us and bird tomorrow, even though it's a little colder than it often is <laughs> during this time. Um, hopefully we can still get out and enjoy the outdoors and birds for Global Big Day. Thank you. Uh, so that is, that's everything we have. Um, thank you so much for uh, staying and uh, joining on. Um, and we, we really appreciate you taking the time to learn about this activity. Um, I, I think it's incredibly rewarding and I cannot express how much joy it has brought me. Um, and I, I really think that um, taking time to sit down and appreciate nature and just watch nature will um, really help during a time that is, it's pretty crazy right now. Um, but the birds are still all out doing their thing. Um, so I definitely recommend going and doing some bird watching. And if you have any, any questions at all, um, please email us. We're very happy to hear from our members um, and, and we really wanna be more in touch. So definitely send us an email. Thank you so much. And um, I think we'll be good. Thank you. Oh, we have someone asking about the guided walks. Um, and right now our field trips are canceled up until the end of May. And we have, we will kind of keep people posted about when those will begin again. We don't have anything planned at this time. And Sarah, you could maybe exit the thing and just we can stay on to debrief.